catch it. Doing Kill Bill, Quentin's big thing for me was when you're in the costume and you're in front of the camera, you are part of the bride, you are the bride. And it was sort of something that I think I'd always believed but I'd never verbalised or heard it verbalised that is, it's not Zoe doing this on set, it's not Zoe getting this attention, it's I am part of this character, I'm a piece of the whole. Definitely need to get a tight one of that one. That's one of my new favourite photos of me and my mum. I just love this face. Just in awe. I was born uh, in New Zealand on a little island called Waiheke, which is just off the coast of Auckland. I've always enjoyed the sensations of being up high, of going fast. I was a massive tree climber. The higher I could get up, the kind of more exciting and fun it was. Like, if I could get to the top and have a view from the top of the tree, I was like, that, that went down in my favourites, his favourite tree. I would just disappear into the forest and catch tadpoles or make forts in the forest. And then when it started getting dark, I would come home. I mean, it's sort of, when I think back at it now, it's like dreamy, really, the, the sort of childhood that I had. And the weird thing about life is that because it was so normal and I had no other comparison, it was just, that was the norm. Maybe I was different and just different enough that I just didn't notice. <laughs> That's about as girly as I got at that age. That's sort of the feminine Zoe. This is me most Friday nights. Mm -hmm. It sounds obvious, but my strengths have always been the things that I'm most passionate about. So English, I always did really well in English. PE, physical education, obviously, photography. And it was sort of concerning to me at some point when I realised I should be considering, you know, a career or something at some point. I was like, where in the world do those three things apex in something that I could monetize? When you're selling a hit, it's all about, for me, if I'm gonna hit you, Bunk straight in the face. If you imagine that whatever this is travels out the other end. So if I'm hitting you in the nose, it's like something's pulling you on the back of the head. So after high school, did you go to university? No, I took a year off after high school because I didn't know what I wanted to be. My dad would have been a doctor. My mum had been a nurse and a real estate agent. I was toying with the idea of going to med school, but I didn't have sort of a passion for it. So the plan was to take a year off see how, what was going on in my life and my world before I'd committed to going to university. And in that year, basically I had finished doing gymnastics when I was 15, 16, but I'd stayed training because I just sort of loved it. And I had met a man by the name of Peter Bell, no relation, who turns out was like a stuntman in New Zealand. It just sort of popped up in a bunch of different places in my life, including my dad was working at an ER and he had had a stuntman come in that had a concussion and a bump on the head and I had been banging on about it at home because I'd seen an interview with a stuntman on TV and I was like I'm sorry people get paid to do what you know and dad then came home with the phone number of this Pete Bell guy that I had been training with and it's funny because suddenly now I had direct access to it and then I was terrified. I was like, hell no, I'm not calling that guy. Like, what am I going to say? And what am I going to tell him I think I'd be good at it? Dad was like, yeah. I was like, ugh, that goes against every grain in my body. And he basically locked me outside with the phone and was like, and he wasn't trying to be profound. He was just speaking sense. But he said, here's the thing. You could not make the phone call today and you'd wake up tomorrow in exactly the same place you are, which is great. You've got a good life. You're healthy, happy, no big deal. You could make the phone call and wake up tomorrow and nothing's changed. Or you could, it's gonna make me cry, or you could make the phone call and you could <laughs> wake up tomorrow a stunt woman. But if you don't make the call, you definitely won't wake up a stunt woman. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> that is so weird. I don't think I've ever cried telling that story. That's Amazon High, the first job that I ever did. I wish I could zoom in like new school technology so you could look at just how full like whatever tomboy face I had. My first job was down there for three weeks. I met this group of stunt people when it was like I had found family instantly. And we're all loads, a variety of different personalities, but whatever that mutual joy or appreciation of the work is, I'd not felt it like that before. It was a 
Dunno, I was just like, I'd, I'd like to do this forever. <laughs> These are quite classic. Xena days, this is obviously the same episode, but it was often me and the, a bunch of stunt guys, a number of whom are now my forever brothers. Lucy, without a doubt, has been such an informative role model, really. I knew when I watched her, that's the kind of person I wanted to be on set. She was the lead. She took her work seriously, but she always set this sort of tone that was like lighthearted. She was super accessible, was really impressed by how she conducted herself. Lucy had said, you know, you and I are often the nucleus of the mood on set and it's important that you accept and respect that responsibility. And I remember being like, that is one of those I should write it down lessons. And it turns out I didn't need to write it down because I'll, I'll never forget it. The first real injury I had was on Xena. We were doing a gag where Xena's, she flips off the platform and lands in the town square. She's like two stories up. And Pete Bell, who was my coordinator at the time, was like, I don't think it's you know, physically possible to get you to clear this platform before you flip. And I was 19, I guess, at the time. And I was like, I can, I can make it work. But so I under-rotated and I hit the end of my wires flat with my back towards the ground. So my hips stopped and everything else didn't. First thought was, oh my God, what if I can never work again? And then I had a moment where I was like, what if I can never walk again? But you know what, the funny thing is, that wasn't when I learned the lesson. I then went to hospital, I had fractured one of the little nubby bits in my vertebrae, I had to like rest or whatever. But I went back to work a couple of weeks later, and I walked onto set that day and Paul, the director, the second unit director, looked at me and he was like, why are you here? And I was like, I'm fine, look, I can do all the things, you know, fine. And he was like, okay, well, we're breaking a chair over your back. I was like, oh no, I've got two back pads on, it'll be fine. And we rolled cameras and they broke this chair over my back and it just dropped me. I was like crying involuntarily, like wasn't, <laughs> but tears were rolling. I couldn't breathe. I was in like the most severe pain ever. And Paul looked at me and he was like, go home. Don't come back until you're better because we need you, but you're no good to us broken. That was the lesson. It's not about being strong. It's about being competent. I was working on Xena and one of the ADs came to set and was like, Zoe, there's a call for you on the set phone. Her name is Amanda McKayley and she was the director of, of Double Dare. And I guess her story is she had been wanting to do this documentary on Hollywood stunt woman. And I was like, shit, no, I don't want to do that. She was like, what, what do you mean? I was like, no, because you're going to expect me to be fit and healthy and working out all the time. I eat McDonald's, I drink all the time, I smoke like a pack of cigarettes a day, I am not the person you want. Like, if you're going to splice that, I'm going to have to fake it and I'm not doing that. And so he rang back and was like, I don't know how else to say this, but I like that you swear and I'm down with the fact that you smoke cigarettes and I don't care that you don't work out. And at that point I went, sure, you know. And through that, in a random sort of a way, I ended up at the auditions for Kill Bill. Well, it's me and Uma in China. Cute, that one. I don't have very many with her, so that's rad. This is me in the Crazy 88 and Quentin, squished in the middle there. Killed all of them. <laughs> we drive into the Beijing Film Studios, and my memory is such that I walk in, and I'm in the studio with, you know, the 20, Chinese fight team members, and, and that's kind of it. I'm just there. There was a woman, Satya, who was there to do all the like, wushu sword stuff for Uma. I remember at one point watching Satya be taught some of the fight beats, and then they walked away and left her to it. And she got about sort of four or five beats in, and I could see her sort of not know what the next, she couldn't remember what the next move was. And I remembered what the next move was, I just didn't know how to do it. And I'd said to her, I was like, I think it's that thing where you, you know, go over your head, and she was like, oh, you mean this? And I was like, yeah, that, what it, that thing, you know. And there came a, the agreement, basically, that she would, they would teach her the fight. I would watch, remember the choreography, because that's what I'd been doing for four years on Xena. And then I would teach her the choreography, and she would teach me how to do the moves. And then the first day we were on set to shoot the fight, I was sitting there in the costume, and all I can remember is them going, like, we're going to go through this part of the fight, and Tiger walked through it. And they were like, ah, ah, soy. And I was like... I'm sorry, what? He was like, we're gonna do this part of the fight. And I was like, okay, cool. Blah. And I got up and I did it. And afterwards I walked up to Didi and I was like, you never taught me that fight. Like, and he was like, yeah, but we've been watching. 
And that was it. That was sort of, uh, then I became a bit of everything double. One of the things that I loved about Death Proof, and when Quentin was sitting in my house telling me about it for the first time, like, you know that character that's called Zoe, that's called Zoe because it's you, and you're gonna play that role. Him talking about the importance of that stunt community and the way that we think and the way that we communicate and having two of the lead roles being stunt people and, you know, was, I was so honored on behalf of the stunt community and on behalf of the behind the scenes. It was so important to him that the movie wasn't an expose of what's behind the curtains, but like a kudos to the hidden heroes. That that's, and that's how we really felt about them. Hateful at Quentin's words to me on that. My memory is him basically being like, look, your job in this movie is to be as cute as possible and then die good. And I was like, cute, can do. Die good, definitely. You know, <laughs> one of the first times you really see me, I pop up into the little cut into the carriage, and it was the second time we went to do it, and Tim Ross was in there, and I popped up, and I was like blah 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 blah, and I looked at Tim, and I, and he was just looking at me like, like not in character at all, like completely just like, look at her, you know, <laughs> and we fin I finished it, and like cut blah blah blah. And Tim came up to me afterwards. He was like, "You're so adorable. I, you're doing such an amazing job." And I was just like. Tim Roth is telling me I'm doing good acting, that's amazing. Being a stunt coordinator, it was like a perspective shift. And it was an interesting, I think, an interesting thing for Quentin and I too, because our relationship had always been like, he was like, I want this, and I was like, let's do it. And on this one, I was like, ooh, I can't put someone else in that position until I've done all the checks. And I had to figure out a way to do that with him. It was like being an adult stunt person. It was eye-opening in, in, in the best possible way. I think my magic hour is right after the sun comes up. There's something peaceful about that time of the morning because this isn't happening yet. There's, everyone's not awake and it's not all a buzz and the sun's not 100% up. Like, I wake up very easily, so I'm alert. And it's really nice to be alert when the world is sleepy. I have a little... This is my mum in my pocket. <laughs> you know, last year was, there was amazing stuff and there was horrible stuff, but it was like everything was big. All the way through all of it, there's been these moments of beauty that have been undeniable. Mum and dad both, when I would come home and, and tend to be a bit like, I could have done this differently and I wish I'd done that differently and blah, 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 blah. And they were both really vocal and being like, you're where you are for a reason. And that was always mum's sort of thing, was not even a matter of having earned it, but just you've made the decisions you've made along the way and you've put in the work where you've put it that you have led yourself here in some way, shape or form. But when the little girl running around in New Zealand, <laughs> what would she be thinking about Zoe today? I imagine little Zoe would probably be quite enamoured and excited that that's what she had to look forward to. I think there'd probably be also, if she was emotionally cognizant enough at the time, to probably try and remind me of that freedom that comes from the fearlessness and how to re-engage with that. That sometimes putting meaning on stuff just makes it harder. I do this career because I love the work. I've learned how to sort of play that game with kind of my own set of rules. I'm starting to figure that out. <laughs>